Welcome to Hard Questions. This is where we gather pastors together to take on your tough questions and answer them right from the Bible. I'm Tom Hollis, the moderator, and today our panelists include... Dr. William R. Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. Ray Heipel, Providence Presbyterian Church in Robinson Township. Pete Jacklone, lead pastor, South Hills Assembly God Church, Bethel Park, PA. J. Anthony Gilbert, pastor of Another Level Ministries in the North Hills area. Well, pastors, thank you for being with us uh, today we're on Hard Questions. We're going to talk about the book of Revelation and the end times. We're going to talk about rising from the dead, all kinds yeah. of stuff today. So uh, let's start with this question. It's an audio question. Uh, and let's go to that right now. And I have a question for you from the book of Revelation. Uh, I've not been able to get a definitive answer over the years from numerous theologians from various sources. So I'm hoping you'll be able to help me get some clarity on it. Um, I'm referring to Revelation 20, verses 4 to 6, but specifically uh, verse 5. Will those taken up in the rapture be part of the millennium or not? Uh, will we be in heaven or on earth with, for those thousand years? And then the second part of my question is, will we be integrated with those who come out of the um, tribulation unscathed? Will they also have heavenly bodies? And... Um, I ask because obviously there will have to be marriage and procreation in order to last for the 1,000 year period. And lastly, uh, will those raptured be ruling and judging from heaven or uh, the 1,000 years on earth? Well, there are a lot of questions there and there are a lot of theological trails we can go down with this, but I'm gonna ask uh, Pastor Glaze to start us off. Yeah, I was gonna say that, uh, you know, there are different viewpoints fundamentally, you know, uh, premillennial, amillennial, postmillennial. So I want to make it clear to the uh, caller that my answer is coming from a premillennial standpoint. Okay. And, and so uh, I believe the next thing on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture, where he will take Christians out of this world. And then there'll be seven years of tribulation on the earth. At the end of the tribulation, Christ will come back that will be the second coming of Christ, or some people call it the battle of Armageddon. Mm -hmm. Christians will come back with him, mm -hmm. right? And, and those coming out of the tribulation, those saved individuals coming out, uh, they will still have human bodies. But you know, when we are caught up into heaven, we'll have our glorified bodies. Okay. So we'll come back and we will rule and reign with Christ mm -hmm. for the thousand years. Mm -hmm. But there still will be human beings that have come out of the tribulation and they will continue to procreate. And, uh, and so, you know, that's kind of uh, the, uh, the thumbnail version of maybe answering most of the questions that, that, that were asked here. But yeah, uh, as Christians, you know, we will come back. We will be here during the millennial. And the Bible says that we will rule and reign with Christ. So we, at that point, you know, we will rule and reign with Christ during the millennium in our glorified bodies. And, 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 and the last part about that is, and it will be here on earth. Right. We're not gonna be ruling and reigning. Right, exactly. So that, so basically you're kind of confirming the direction she's going here with her question right. in a lot, a lot of cases. Uh, let's, let's go over for a different point of view. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I don't even know where to begin. Well, uh, that's I, what I said, there's like <laughs> at least three major theological there's, streams in there. There's a lot of different views. And I, and I think, you know, she said she's, she's not getting a definitive. I think you, you got a definitive answer. You're going to get a definitive answer here. I don't think either one of us would say we're absolutely sure that every part of our view is correct. But, you know, the way we understand scripture, we have to put forward, especially as Bible teachers in a humble way. So I come from it from what's called the all millennial perspective. And all that means is we don't believe that there is a literal physical millennium, but the millennium is the spiritual reign of Christ. When Christ ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of power. He will never have more power and authority than he has now. All authority has been given to me, he says. So uh, when Christ took that and he sat down, that's the millennium. And the Bible talks about that we too have that authority with him. Um, and so, for example, it talks about uh, in Ephesians 1:20, Christ, when he was raised, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And then Ephesians 2, uh, we are raised up together and made to sit together in the heavenly places with Christ. So spiritually speaking, you and I already have all authority. We are with Christ seated in the heavenly places. And the idea that you're getting at in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, 
of the first resurrection, says this is the first mm -hmm. resurrection, the way I understand that is what Jesus taught in John chapter 5, that unless we are born again, John chapter 3, um, we will not see the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said that people were being born again right now in his time. In fact, he saw, taught this in John 5, 24 and 25. I say to you, who, he who hears my word and believes has everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. And then he says this, most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is. The hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. That was happening right now in Jesus' time. They were living again. This was the first resurrection. Then he says in verse 28, do not marvel at this. The hour is coming. The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and those who have done good will come to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. That's the resurrection of, of the body. That will happen on the last day. But right now, the first resurrection, if you're in Christ, you are reigning with him. You've been raised. You are enjoying spiritually the millennium. All things are under your feet because all things are under his feet. All right. Well, again, this is <laughs> again. Uh, I had to talk uh, fast the, to get all that. I mean, this is this. These have been uh, discussed for many, many years. The different uh, the, the, the different timing issues of where where all this falls. Jay, what's your view on all this? I think pretty much Dr. Glaze Ditto. has kind of said it all. Yeah. <laughs> just Ditto. 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 that direction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Over here. I, I, I personally believe that there is a literal thousand year reign. The Bible talks about how the lion will lay down with the lamb, that God, Jesus is going to restore back. That's one of the reasons why I believe that the, um, the seven years of tribulation is God's determined dealing with the Jewish people because right, he told right. them even in Jerusalem before when he came into the triumphal entry, he said, I would have loved to have gathered you, but he couldn't gather them. So he said, now you will not see me again. And you say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, which is what will happen in the middle of those seven years. So, or at the end of those seven years, rather. So I, I believe that there's an actual thousand year reign that Jesus is going to, that's why many of the Jewish people missed him before because they thought what he was going to do at the uh, end of the seven years, he was going to do when he came to die. Mm -hmm. He did not come as a reigning king. He came as a suffering lamb. And so that's the reason why John had the revelation of him in Revelation chapter one. And that's why I believe he even saw that. He said, this is who I'm coming back as. Yeah. He was that when he came on earth for those 33 and a third years. Right. But the reality was, is that he was not here to rule and reign at the time. He was here to pay the price. But when he comes back, John gets his revelation saying, this is the guy whose hair is white as wool and his feet were like bronze. I mean, he's a whole different guy that's I mean, coming this back. This is John who was closer to Jesus in his flesh than anybody. Yeah. And, and, he, and he sees him as in his full majesty, incredible in Revelation. Which is what I think is so cool. That's why when Jesus was there, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he, when they said, are you Jesus? He said, I am. They all fell backwards. Yeah. A little bit of him every once in a while would come up. He'd say, I'm still the man. <laughs> Let me just remind y'all, even though I'm here to pay the price for you, I still am he. Uh -huh. and, but when he comes back, he's going to be the fullness mm -hmm. of his majesty. And then he's going to set up and rule and reign the way the Jewish people wanted him to way back in the beginning. So Yeah, yeah, very, very good point. Well, Pete, you, you, you know, know. I'm you know I'm going with these two. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. And I, I want to ask you a little question. Okay. So we're saying then uh, on this side, we'll, we'll all get, we'll, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll stone Ray in a prank. Okay. We're not, we're not being bullied. We're not being brother over there. Leave him alone. Uh, that's right. You know, but, I love you, man. But right now we're going to stay over here for a little bit. But uh, as we're stay saying that the, right. the, the rapture and the second coming of Christ, we're talking about two distinctly different Without things. A Without yeah. a doubt. The yeah. rapture, as, as Dr. Glaze says, the rapture is uh, at a moment's note, twin Twinkling of an eye, the trump of God shall, shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are shall alive and remain shall be ever be caught up with the Lord. And then after that, after the tribulation, whether the tribulation is, uh, whether we're taken up at the beginning of the tribulation, which is the pre-trib, or the middle of the tribulation, which is the mid-trib, that's two or three and a half good years. A few uh, other different yeah, beliefs yeah, in there. Yeah, there's others. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, and then after that, we're going to come down and rule with Christ for a thousand years. And uh, it, again, in, in Revelation chapter 24 through 6, it really gives a real good... I like the amplified version of it. And um, uh, it, it, this one thought, this is the first resurrection. Blessed, happy, prosperous to be admired. And holy is the person who takes part in it. You make that first resurrection, you're in. Absolutely. I, I, I love this discussion. And, and you know, it's funny. 
Because I've always taken a kind of, I don't really care position. God's going to work this all out. But you know what? He didn't leave that open to me. He I talks a lot about in, in uh, Matthew 24 and other places where uh, that we need to be aware, right? We need to right. be aware, but we need to be aware. Why do we need to be aware, Pastor Glaze, so that our, our hearts are ready and that right. our, our lives are ready? Right, I like what uh, one of my professors at Liberty said, Dr. Ed Heinsohn, he said, God didn't give us uh, prophecy to scare us. He gave it to us to prepare us. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, what you're saying is that, you know, we can look at that and be prepared, you know, by accepting Christ, by looking forward to his coming, uh, that we would be prepared for his return. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the reason why we thank God for shows like Signs of the Times, uh, because the, the, the little plug, shameless plug little right shameless, there. Shameless, uh, shameless, because shameless I believe plug. we need you need to be aware of what's happening in the yeah. news. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Bible talks about how even though we call the show Signs of the Times, Jesus in Matthew 24, I believe it is Luke 19, yeah. all those he talked about the signs of those times. But this is the times of the signs. We're seeing the Bible unfold. So watching the news, the things that happen in Turkey and Syria, all the stuff that's happening with Russia and Ukraine, it's all, it's all in your Bible. If you read it and understand it, it's all starting to form and take shape. So we need to be aware of what's happening. And that's why in Matthew 24, he said, look up, because when you see all these things happening, your redemption is drawing nigh to you. Well, I, I tell you what, I want to wrap this up because I want to read something to you guys because we all love each other here. We love Ray. We love, <laughs> we <all> love <laughs> what about you specifically? <laughs> <laughs> but listen, someone wrote in and they, they shared this and they, they talked about how they called in for, to our prayer line here at Cornerstone, but they said this, I'm also very thankful for hard questions. I just love, she underlines love. I just love that show. God uses it to answer questions that I have, although I've never called in myself. Well, uh, her name's Carla. And, uh, you know, just, it, it, it makes feel good, doesn't it? Amen. That what we're doing here, Amen. it's ministering. So we thank you, Carla, for writing in. We'd love to hear from, from uh, anyone who's being ministered by this program. Well, coming up in 60 seconds, we talk about what happens when you die. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Hard Questions. Our next question is this. Why is it said that Jesus will come and raise the dead, yet when someone dies, people say, absent from the body, present with the Lord? How are you raised up if you're already present with the Lord? Interesting question, right. Pastor Pete. Well, you know, all of us pastors, I'm sure at a funeral time, <clears throat> we'll do something which is known as a committal. And at that committal, we'll, we will commit the body to the grave and the spirit to the Lord. So when Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present, we're talking about the spirit of that man is now in the presence of the living God. But then we have to also know for a fact there's going to be a resurrection of the body. So let me read some scripture, okay? Sure. In, uh, it's, it's found here in 1 Corinthians 15, and it's a little lengthy, but I'll, I'll, I'll read fast. Uh, now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, we are fo found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ when he whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep, it's King James, very poetic, meaning they died. We don't believe in soul sleep. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of most men most pitiable. Uh, King James is miserable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So, there, you know, uh, and we're also told in 1 Thessalonians to, to comfort one another with these words. Uh, also, we see uh, again the resurrection of the dead in, in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 42 through 45. So I really believe with all of my heart because this is a big question that people ask after a funeral. They'll, they'll pull me aside and say, where's my loved one? I always go back to scripture to be absent from this body. That person's spirit is in the presence of Almighty God. And then there's going to be a reuniting one day uh, where the body's going to be resurrected. That's a, that's a comforting word. Right. Yeah, I think Pete nailed it. I mean, the question isn't making the distinction that you made, and rightly so, that there is, uh, a, you know, we are soul and body. 
And so when we die, the moment we die, our souls go to be with the Lord. Our spirits are with Him. And, and you see uh, Paul referring to that. He talks about you know, whether or not he should stay or remain uh, in yes, 1 Corinthians. Yes, yes. And, and he actually says you know, that I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ. And mm -hmm. he's talking about dying. His passion. But he would have been with Christ in his soul the moment he would have died. And Jesus says the same thing to the thief on the cross, you know, that yeah. today you'll be with me in paradise. That day when that man died, his spirit went. You know, that we have the passage in, um, what is it, Luke, uh, I believe, 17, where the, the angels carry Lazarus to Abraham's side. And so he's with the Lord and uh, a lot of places. So that, you know, you have to understand that, yes, the body will not be raised until the last day when the trump sounds and, and, uh, and we will be changed. The body will be raised. We don't want to deny that. We are soul and body, and that body is integral to our humanness. Someday your body will be raised without weakness, without disease, without suffering. It'll never grow old. It'll never die. You'll never get out of shape. You, know, to, you, know, you can eat all, all the these problems, you losing your hair. Oh my goodness. You know, all, all the, those aches and pains the, the just fall, disappear. The curse <laughs> is gone. Yes, yeah, an eternal life. But your soul will enjoy that the moment you die. Now, do, Ray, let me throw this out, if I may. Sure, do do you guys ahead. think that we'll have a, a, a body that uh, will, I'm sure it's not going to be this one again. I think it's going to be a, a glorified. Uh, well, I, I believe that uh, God will raise this body up. But it'll be transformed. Okay. It'll be transformed. Okay. Be transformed. Like a transformer. I believe, yeah. I believe there yeah. will be a body, right? Because, oh, yeah. oh, I mean, yeah. even in, in uh, I think it's in Revelation where he gives them garments to wear. Yes. You know, yeah, so you got to have, have a body yeah. if you're going to be wearing yeah. garments. Yeah. You know? Well, it says here in the scripture as well in 1 Corinthians 15, which is a great passage to read uh, if you want to go really deep into this. As a matter of fact, I was reading it and I was like, boy, I should preach this soon. This yeah. is so good. The whole verse, the whole chapter in 15 yeah. is phenomenal. It said, for this corruptible must put on incorruptible, Amen. this mortal must put on immortality. So when this That's corruptible great. is put on incorruption and this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, death is swallowed up of victory. Or death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? So I think one of the things, one of the greatest stamps, God would not have healed our bodies if he did not plan to totally redeem them. Yeah. So the fact that we're being healed, if we're believing God for healing, is proof of the fact that they have to be redeemed yeah. because it's yeah. just giving us a little bit saying, I'm healing this now, but I'm going to redeem it totally later on. So I think the final thing, that's where I said it's swallowed up at that point. The moment our bodies are resurrected with our souls and our spirits, however you want to put it, then at that point, the, the saying is now completely finalized and redemption is complete now that the body itself right. has even been overcome. Or has been uh, redeemed as well. Redeemed as well. All and again, all those things, all those aches and pains, all those things will be gone from that body. You know, guys, just real quick. When I was in college, I had a professor who was very. Uh, he was one of the world's leading authorities on cemeteries, which sounds like a really <laughs> funny side issue, but that he did. And he took us around to several uh, ones out in nearby uh, our campus, and he took us to an old family one. And he said, "Notice how all these graves face east." And, and that was the way they buried people in yeah. some of these small yeah. cemeteries that when they would rise up, they'd be facing Christ who was gonna Aww. return from the east. Isn't that interesting? Kind of cool, kind of cool little quirky thing there. But if you're buried facing west, you just turn around, it'll be fine. So, uh, well, coming up, we ask, will we have to give an account for every word we say? Wow, stay tuned. Matthew 12, 36 and 37 talks about speaking idle words and giving an account for our words. Well, we have to give an account for every word. Does this mean if I speak an idle word, I will go to hell? Wow, that's a strong one, strong point there, Jay. What, what can you tell us about this? Well, you know, I think idle word is a bad translation. Okay. Um, you know, it's not idle word, like you use the word the or whatever. When you break that word down, it comes from the word, it's rema argos, which means um, every uncautious, careless, a uh, sinful word that you speak. Mm -hmm. So it's not just an idle word. When you think of idle, when you come from westernized mind, you think of just any, just a flippant word. Yeah. You know, and he's talking about in that passage as well about how out of the heart, 
you know, what comes out of the heart. So he's talking about, when he's talking about the idle words, he's talking about those evil words from the heart that we will have to give an account of for those things. Not just like, well, you know, I went to the store and I went there like, you're gonna give an account for that. You know what I mean? It's not an idle word the way that we would think the word idle. It's speaking more in depth of evil words that we speak. And almost going back to where, remember when the children of Israel were getting ready to go into the promise that the Bible says they brought up an evil report. That would be considered an idle word that they had spoken and it sealed their faith because of the report and what they spoke. So they had to give an account for what they spoke. And I believe there are certain times in our lives we have to be careful. And I believe that we're in a season even now that um, there are certain seasons where you have to be careful about what you declare. Your words hold power, whether they're sinful or they're in faith, they still hold power. And what we declare, God will hold us accountable because he gave us the power and the authority, which means we must be responsible where authority has been given. Well, with, our, uh, with the, uh, the, the scouts that went into the promised land and came back with an evil report, they were moving completely not in faith at all no. in that, certainly. Ray, why, why don't you give us your take on this? Yeah, I think, uh, again, there's a little bit of um, lack of distinction in the question. Um, you know, I agree with Jay, we will give an account for everything that we do. We're moral creatures made in the image of God and nothing that we do doesn't matter. You know, I think that's crucial. If we didn't have to give an account for a bunch of stuff that we did, well then I guess there was nothing that mattered there. There was no meaning. We weren't living for God in that moment. And of course we always are living for the Lord. So everything that we do matters, but it's not about going to heaven or going to hell yes. because it's not yes. by your works that you're saved. Yes, it's by trusting in Christ and Christ alone that you're Amen. saved. The moment you believe in him, you have eternal life. You can't lose it. God keeps you. He's changed you. He's given you a new nature. You're seated with him. He says you have right now eternal life. It's not something you'll get if you can somehow hold on tight enough. You have it. You can't lose it. So uh, once you have eternal life be entirely by the righteousness of Christ and by the atoning sacrifice of Christ, then we live for him. But once again, everything that we do matters. And I think with regard to the believer, every idle word will determine, or every word, I, I agree with you, Jay, there's nothing idle about it, but every word will determine either a reward. Jesus said, even a cup of cold water, just mm -hmm. give somebody a cup of, in my name will by no means lose its reward. But also there are those, 1 Corinthians talks about it, that will have some of the stuff burned up because right. they didn't build on Christ with gold and silver, they built, you know, they, they did works, of, they wasted their time and, and they'll lose reward, but they won't lose heaven. By the same token, the wicked, every evil deed will have another eternity of punishment for that deed. A uh, theologian I like used to say the, the souls in hell would give everything they could to have one less sin charged to them because one, for every sin, it's another punishment that goes on forever. And so it's true, everyone's going to give an account for their words, but the redeemed, it's a matter of re rewards. Not a whether heaven or hell yes, issue we don't at, heaven all, or hell at all. all. That's a very big there. key yeah. point here, Pete. Well, and then something else there, uh, if we look at the second part of that in Matthew, it says uh, 12, 36, for by your words you'll be justified. In other words, and by the very same words that you go to justify yourself, I cannot justify myself before God no matter what. And the very words that I use to justify myself are going to be the very words that are going to condemn me. Now, again, as it was brought out, and I'm so glad, this is not a matter of heaven uh, or hell. This is a matter that we are going to be judged for all that we've done. Yeah. Um, and then on to heaven. Right. And, and before I go over to you, Pastor Glaze, I noticed when I looked at this in context, he's talking to the Pharisees who were denying people the... The, the truth of the gospel and denying people. What, what's your take on this? Well, I think you've got to break it down into two groups, unbelievers and right. believers. Right. Unbelievers will give an account of every, you know, idle word or, you know, word that, as yes, you defined it, Jay. You know, they will give them at the, at, the, uh, at the great white throne, you know, they will be judged for their works. So they will give an account. Now, I struggle with the idea of believers uh, giving an account. And the reason being is because weren't all of our sins accounted for on the cross? Mm -hmm. You know, didn't, didn't Jesus, didn't he bear our sins on the cross? So I don't think that we'll give an account, you know, for, our, for, for the sinfulness of our words. I think we'll give an account for our stewardship mm -hmm. so that if those idle words, those idle words can affect our stewardship yeah. and not necessarily, because again, you know, you know, time and time again, the Bible says that 
the blood of Christ covers all sin, mm -hmm. that God puts his sins in the middle, our sins in them and he remembers them no more. So, you know, if that's true, then, you know, we're not going to give an account from that standpoint, but we'll give an account from a stewardship standpoint. That's so good. You know, and so I, again, uh, to, to you who wrote this question in, to you who maybe were wondering about this scripture, your, your salvation is not based on whether you said something idly, whether you let something slip, whether you, something just happened to fly out of your mouth and you're like, oh my gosh, it's an idle word, am I going to hell? No, our salvation is not based on that, but it's on grace through faith. And, uh, you know, so it's important to remember that because the enemy can play havoc with us in those things. Well, we like to end the program with a scripture. And uh, this is a great one from 1 Peter where it says, Therefore, with minds that are true, that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. That's 1 Peter 1.13. Real quick, Pete, reaction to that scripture the grace that is set to come to you when Christ is revealed. Um, can I pass on that? <laughs> I, 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 was, I was in La La Land. I was, I was, I was going See, to the... <laughs> Pete was speaking idle words over yeah. here, I think. Yeah, I, you yeah. know, no, yeah. that's, that's great. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's program. We want to hear from you. Email us your question to hardquestions at ctvn.org or call into the hotline at 412-349-4326.